that's lovely. A friendly audience. Uh, welcome to the session on uh, hunter-gatherers and hunter-gatherer worlds. Um, and today we want to talk about the way in which we think about hunter-gatherers in their world. And the way in which hunter-gatherers and their interactions and their relationships with the world has changed quite dramatically over the last two decades, or maybe slightly more. Um, traditional 20th century accounts of hunter-gatherers in the world has been quite anthropocentric in the sense that it's been dominated by um, economic accounts of hunter-gatherers moving through their landscape, exploiting it economically in terms of the materials, the plants, the animals, um, and moving through economic landscapes. More recently, people have started to challenge this, to start thinking about whether these uh, Western approaches are necessarily that appropriate for thinking about hunter-gatherer groups. In particular, people have started to think uh, relationally. They're thinking relationally about hunter-gatherers and their world. And by that, we mean not moving away from the idea that non-human elements of their world, so animals, plants, uh, landscape features, materials, moving away from the idea that these are objectified uh, and that they are static, and instead opening the door to think about the ways in which they may have been active in the lives of hunter-gatherers and how they may have actually uh, had significant relationships with hunter-gatherers and how they may have shaped the way that hunter-gatherers thought about elements of their world and indeed how they then behaved. And it's these behaviours, these material actions, that archaeology is particularly interested in thinking about because these are the actions that we want to interpret as archaeologists. Now, these kind of relational approaches have come under really rather a, a wide um, set of banners. So we have things like uh, assemblage theory, symmetrical archaeology, entanglement theory. We have social zoo archaeology. We have anthrozoology. We have relational archaeologies, um, relational ecologies, multi-species archaeologies. And that list can go on. So we've got a, a number of different approaches. And really in this session today, we're hoping to pull people together from different schools of thought and from different approaches to see if we can um, sort of set a path for a more cohesive relational archaeology of hunter-gatherers in the future. <laughs> okay, so um, some of these um, approaches, uh, relational approaches, can be considered under the umbrella of the post-humanist critique. Um, and a relational approach is central um, to what has been called the ontological turn. Um, and this covers a diverse range of approaches, as um, Nick just mentioned, uh, with significant differences between them. Um, but what's common amongst um, them, perhaps, is a focus on eradicating uh, the dualisms that are persistent in our discipline, so nature, culture, mind, body, self, other, etc., and challenging the anthro anthropocentric assumptions that are inherent uh, with some previous approaches. So that of a hierarchical perception of the world um, with a dominant humanity and a subservient nature, um, instead arguing for a flat ontology, um, at least at the start of our analysis, um, where people are not ontologically prior um, to anything else, and human and non-human elements of the world are on an equal footing. And this, therefore, opens up a space for narratives that are founded on the relationships between humans, places, animals, trees, plants, stones, and many other things. Um, some approaches also recognise not just the interrelationships between people and things, but also acknowledge that um, people and things themselves um, are the outcome of these relationships, of these mixtures and entanglements. Therefore, there's also a focus on process, um, that these relationships, as well as uh, people and things in the world, are not fixed or static, but always in a process um, of becoming. Um, and so some of these different approaches have been starting to contribute in various ways to our understandings um, of the archaeology of past hunter-gatherers. Um, and I just wanted to give a, a few quick examples by way of illustration, so apologies for anyone I've left out. Um, I'm not doing an exhaustive list, um, just a taster. Um, so the work of Chantal Canella, in particular in An, Arche an Archaeology of Material, um, draws on the new materialist approaches 
and also ideas from non-Western um, ontologies to rethink the role of materials um, and their relationship to, the, um, to form and design in particular. Um, and she's using case studies from the Upper Paleolithic and the Mesolithic. Um, so, for example, in the Middle Magdalenian, exploring how the qualities of stone and bone involve themselves in the design um, of cave art and pendants, respectively. Uh, for the origination, that people and ways of making come together to draw out specific uh, qualities from different materials, um, in that case, luster and shine uh, to make basket-shaped beads. So in this way, materials, um, in Canella's work, are not static and waiting to be transformed by humans, but they're active participants uh, in the creation of these objects and they're contingent to each specific assemblage that they're bound up in. She also explores um, the significance of human-animal interactions in the Mesolithic in terms of the harnessing of active animal effects uh, in objects made from animal remains, such as those of, of red deer. Um, and this is a good example of a, a move away from seeing animals as symbolic or representative and, appear, um, and appreciating the relationships with them as living agents um, in past worlds. And that's something also explored by Nick um, in his work with Yanis Hamalakis in their call for a social zoo archaeology. Uh, so moving away from an anthropocentric approach to one that's concerned with the detail of animal lives and the detail of their species level relationships with human beings. So a zoo ontology, um, as they coin it. Um, Hannah Cobb has also advocated an assemblage approach um, to the Mesolithic. Um, so in her paper, she discusses uh, the example of the deposition of thousands of hazelnut shells, um, roasted hazelnut, stone tools, and other material at Stylesdale on Colonsay on the west coast of Scotland. Um, here, she suggests um, that rather than speaking only to subsistence practices, and the static single site, uh, that the assemblage of the materials, places, actions, and people gathered there serves to capture the mobility of hunter-gatherer life in that landscape, and that the act of assembling those multiple materials, places, actions, and times um, might have imbued uh, specific places with significance as well. More recently, her and I have jointly discussed how um, a relational approach can also illuminate the ways in which we think about identity um, in the Mesolithic, how identity was made and remade. Um, and an assemblage approach allows us to consider the people that we're so interested in, but also uh, thinking of them as, as partners with and products of uh, the multiple materials, things and places that <coughs> constituted the Mesolithic world. Um, it's worth reiterating that these approaches argue that analysis should start with a flat ontology, um, but not that the analysis doesn't necessarily end that way, uh, with no variation in power or authority in, in these relations. So the aim being to explore all of the differences between humans and other aspects of the world um, by not assuming from the outset that one of them, humans, have special ontological status in that world. And while some of these approaches to the examples I've given <laughs> Um, obviously engaged with the ideas of Western thinkers such as Latour and Deleuze. Um, others are combining this with, or taking as their starting point, uh, a set of non-Western perspectives on the world, uh, as revealed by ethnography and ethnographers. And I'm going to turn to Barry to talk about that. Okay, so as Amy said, um, as well as drawing on these, these theoretical approaches, some researchers have drawn on ethnographic studies of contemporary and uh, historically attested hunter-gatherers to illustrate the complex ways in which humans relate to other aspects of their world. Now, in some cases, these studies can be very functional and economic in their focus, but still demonstrate sort of, the intersecting webs of relationships in which humans and other aspects of their world are intrinsically bound. So, for example, uh, a number of archaeologists have looked at studies of hunting practices, so ethnographic studies of hunting practices, to show how human actions are closely bound up 
mm. with very specific behaviours of individual animals, and how in turn the actions of both human and animal often involves interactions with a myriad of other factors that can include topography, particular plant communities, uh, time of year, wind direction, and so on. And these studies can lead us to, into some very similar ways of thinking about the frameworks of relationships, or of relations as espoused, espoused in post-humanist theories, and help shift the focus of our inquiry uh, from an overtly anthropocentric uh, perspective to a much more relational one, though arguably without all the complicated philosophy. Um, over the past 15 years or so, archaeologists have also drawn explicitly on ethnographies of animist groups as a way of thinking through uh, relational ontologies amongst past hunter-gatherers. Um, such studies draw on several key aspects of an animist ontology, notably the idea that humans share their world with a host of other sentient animate beings that can include uh, animals, plants, topographic features, but also an array of what we might describe as supernatural beings. Humans are not only aware of the presence of these, of these animate beings, but engaging meaningful social discourse with them, often articulated through prescribed forms of activity. And, the, and one thing that's come from this in particular is, is the idea that animals can be regarded as sentient social beings, aware uh, and knowledgeable of the actions of humans, has really challenged some of the, some of the highly economic focus of the way in which uh, faunal material in archaeological studies has been, has been analysed. Um, archaeologists have also drawn on other aspects of animism to consider things such as how the boundaries between human and animal bodies may not have been fixed, and how the essence of uh, living things persists within elements of their bodies after death. So, for example, uh, Erica Hill has drawn on ethnographic accounts of uh, animist groups uh, to argue that uh, amulets made for the remains of animals or fashioned into forms of animals acted uh, as, as a lure, as a form of hunting charm, drawing prey towards the hunter. Um, or in some other cases allowed hunters to harness particular qualities of animals, such as uh, sort of speed, dexterity, uh, uh, good eyesight and so forth. Uh, and McNiven and Feldman have argued uh, in a similar way for um, uh, animal materials being incorporated into hunting charms amongst groups in the Torres Straits. Now, in some cases, these archaeological studies draw on historical or ethnographic sources where a continuity in practice can be demonstrated between past and present, or at least near-present cultures. So again, uh, Erica Hill, in her work, has demonstrated that prescribed forms of animal bone deposition on the northwest coast of Alaska um, can be traced back over four centuries or more prior to Western contact. And this suggests that the animist ontologies that underpin those deposition reacts have a similar antiquity. Um, in Western Northwest Europe, Marek Svelobel has argued that uh, similarities between the material culture and art of Mesolithic groups in the Baltic region, and with uh, contemporary and near contemporary uh, and, and sorry, historically tested hunter gatherers in the same area, shows sufficient cultural continuity again to justify direct ethnographic analogy between past and present, or between present and past. Uh, and recently, Peter Jordan has also argued that archaeologists studying the Mesolithic of Northwest Europe can draw quite close, even direct analogies with the ethnographies of contemporary hunter-gatherers in Western Eurasia. In other cases, people have drawn a less direct link between past and present societies, and a less direct analogies. And instead, the, the ethnography is used as a way of challenging a very Western-centred view of the past and, alternative, and suggesting alternative ways of interpreting the archaeological record. Um, and again, uh, so sort of going back to Tal Canella's work, I think arguably one of the most influential studies in terms of uh, Western European early Greek history is her work on the Starkar and the Frontlets, where she draws on uh, Viviero de Castro's uh, discussion of uh, Amerindian perspectivism. Um, but what she argues is that this perspectivism doesn't provide a direct analogy to the way Mesolithic groups perceived animals but it's more a way of challenging Western ideas of nature and culture and the concepts of the body. And it's this that allows her to reconsider the ways in which the frontlets may have been used. So two different ways in which ethnographic analogy is being used to think about relational ontologies amongst past hunter-gatherers. So all of this is really good, and it sets a really interesting foundation for producing uh, relational archaeologies of hunter-gatherers. But 
as well as celebrating some of the inspiring and interesting studies that we've had so far, this session also is really starting to want to think about some key questions that we need to consider in order to sort of advance our relational archaeologies further. So we've heard Barry talk about the use of ethnographic analogy, and there are people that advocate the use of uh, direct analogy, where we see this unbroken cultural tradition. But how happy are we to use ethnographic analogies elsewhere, where we don't have this unbroken tradition? There is the danger, uh, as people have written, that we produce, uh, using direct analogies, we essentially turn the British Mesolithic into a version of the Evenki of Siberia, or the Yukagurs. So we need to avoid that, that direct, specific analogy, but how, what is the best way to use general analogies to understand uh, the Mesolithic or the Paleolithic or any other hunter-gatherer group in more detail? And hopefully this is a question that we can discuss through this session. Similarly, we heard Amy talk about these post-humanist approaches. Are there any issues in using post-humanist approaches to study groups that we could consider as pre-humanist or non-humanist? And perhaps really the bigger questions here are thinking about how we can incorporate these different approaches together. In my part earlier on, I showed you that list of different names of approaches. How do we begin to combine different approaches in order to produce a more detailed relational archaeology of hunter-gatherers? Are post-humanist and ethnographic uh, analogy approaches complementary? Do they offer slightly different aspects uh, of hunter-gatherer groups? Do post-humanist frameworks actually offer us the framework we require to use ethnographic parallels more rigorously? So it's these kind of questions that we hope uh, that you'll keep in mind as we go through today's sessions and to also consider maybe pulling key bits of the presentations we see today together to think whether we can formulate a, a more cohesive relational toolkit to approach hunter-gatherer archaeologies. We can think about what kinds of materials, what kind of data and what kind of analysis can or maybe can't be used in our relational studies. Do we need any further frameworks in order to engage with this material in new ways? And can we perceive as a group or as individuals in our studies, can we see any limitations or future challenges that we have in our uh, relational approaches to hunter-gatherers? So it's with that, we would like to welcome you to the session. Um, and we've got a fantastic lineup of really exciting papers on the way. So I hope you'll stick around for the whole afternoon. Thank you.